You know, one thing you will notice about every false religion is they make God more distant, where the gospel makes him nearer. In fact, you know, some of the people that make God the most distant are actually very devout religious people. In Jesus' day, they were Pharisees. They were Orthodox Jews who had memorized all 643 laws of the Old Testament. In fact, today, if you were to go with me to Brooklyn, New York, there are more Jews in Brooklyn than anywhere else in the world. You go to Brooklyn, New York City, you go in the Orthodox Jewish neighborhood, which I've been there, and you'll see these guys, and even this is true on the east side of Providence. You go back on Elm Grove Avenue, where there's a large Jewish community back there. You'll see some of the guys walking down the street wearing the black hats, a black jacket, black pants. If you look on the side of their belt, you will see very thin white ropes. You know what those are? They have counted all the laws of the Old Testament. They know them by heart. And they are seeking to obey every one of these laws. And by the way, a good Jewish person not only is focused on what God says, but he also pays attention especially, even more so, to what the rabbis say. So the rabbis have written a commentary on the Old Testament. It is called the Mishnah. And what the rabbis have done, they want to make sure you don't disobey God's law. So let's say if God's law, the line was right here, the Mishnah puts the line over here. That way, if you, if you don't break this law, you'll never break God's law. But guess what happened to the Jewish mind? The Mishnah has become God's law. So in the Jewish mind, what the rabbis say has more weight than what Scripture says. The rabbi will tell you what Scripture says. By the way, what other church does that sound like? It sounds like the Roman Catholic Church. You say to them, here's what the Bible says. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. It matters what the church says, the magisterium. They will tell me what the scripture says. Okay, and this is exactly what it was like in Jesus' day. And one time, Jesus said in Matthew 23, verse 13, to the Pharisees, he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the, the door to heaven in people's faces. He says in Matthew 23, 13. He says to them, neither yourselves enter, nor do you allow those who would enter to go in. Someone who truly, genuinely, sincerely wants to know about God and the deeply religious people shut the door in their face. This is what religion does. It makes God distant, not near. In fact, what human religion says is God lives in temples and he has to be worshipped as in Colossians where we are now. 2,000 years ago, they were telling people that the flesh, the human body is evil. All the earth is evil. God is so far removed from us that you can never relate to God. God would have nothing to do with you. If you want to relate to him, you have to do a couple of things. Number one, you have to communicate with angels because angels are intermediaries between us and God. So especially they worship the archangel Michael. They thought he was a person that could somehow bridge the gap between them and God. And the Gnostics, the people of that day 2,000 years ago, said, if you want to know God, you have to have a deeper knowledge. That's the word gnosis. That's the Greek word for Gnostics. You have to have a deeper knowledge, which only a select group of people have. And this will help to get you to know God. So you have to make sacrifices to the angels. And, of course, ancient Greece was famous for what else? Some of us has been to ancient Greece. What do you see in the ancient cities of Greece? You see temples everywhere. Temples to the gods, to the goddess Athena, to all the Parthenon, all these temples. One day we read in Acts that Paul went to Athens, Greece. And when he was there, he said to them, I observe that you are all very religious, and I see that you have all these temples. But don't you know... The God that made heaven and earth doesn't dwell in temples made by human hands as though he needed anything from you. He's the one who gives you life and breath. Why do you think God needs your sacrifices? He doesn't need anything from you. And then he said to them, God is actually not far from any one of you. And the reason why he made you, when he did, and where you live is so that you would find him. I honestly believe, guys... We feel on this earth that God is so far away, I think he's much closer than what we realize. 
I think the moment we pass away, it'd be like, wow, I didn't, I, you were way right there. The gospel brings God near. In fact, the Bible says, now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and men. He is the man, Christ Jesus. The Bible says Christ also suffered for sins once that he might bring us to God. What was going on in, in Paul's day happens in our day, everybody. There are lots of people meeting around this city today, this morning, and many religious gatherings are actually making God farther away from the people that are there than making him near because they're not preaching the gospel. Jesus, in fact, said to people that were under the burden of religious teaching, come to me, all you labor and are heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul, soul rest, when the inside of you finally can rest. There's no more labor that you have to do. You're not striving to somehow make God earn his favor by sacraments and ceremonies and Jewish laws. You now find rest. For he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. By the way, here's how you know you found the truth. You find the truth when you feel a sense of rest. When, when actually the burdens have been lifted, not placed on you. And you'll always notice this, guys. Even people that don't really understand the gospel, maybe, they, maybe they're Christians, but the way they teach to live the Christian life makes it feel they're placing burdens. They don't quite understand. And this is what Colossians is written all about. It's to, it's to show you, no... This is who Christ really is, and this is how you live the Christian life. You know, the Gnostics had two errors that they went, they went way to this extreme and way to this extreme. One of the errors of the Gnostics was they taught everyone because matter is evil, almost being human by itself as being evil, just being a normal human being, if you want to make God happy, you have to live an ascetic life. Which means you submit yourself to rigorous self-discipline. You avoid all normal human pleasures. You live in poverty. You separate yourself from all people. And just try to get through this life. Try to avoid any temptation in the world and go live somewhere to hide. That somehow God would be pleased. I told you guys, one time there were some of us, this is the late 1990s when I was a youth pastor. And we went to Montreal, Canada, and there's this beautiful, beautiful cathedral there in Montreal, St. Joseph's Oratory, and very famous in the Roman Catholic religion. And I remember what was a beautiful sunny day and getting out of the van we were in, and I remember seeing this elderly lady. She was on her knees. Now, I don't know how many steps, I mean, there were over 100. Over 100 of these concrete steps going up in the entrance of this cathedral, and this woman is climbing the steps on her knees. Her knees are bleeding. She was hitting herself with something. I don't know what it was, but she was like, they call it self-flagellation. She was showing penance. Oh, God, I'm sorry. And she could finally get up the stairs. And then when she got here, you know what people would do? They would pay, pay money to buy candles to pray for their deceased loved ones. Somehow they're going to do these things, and God is going to be pleased with them. Okay? That's one extreme the Gnostics taught. Abuse your body. Avoid all normal human pleasure. Escape somewhere. God will be pleased with that. That's one extreme. Amazingly, the other extreme that people would go to if they were a Gnostic was, since all flesh is evil and God has nothing to do with it, since God is so far removed from anything to do on earth, just eat, drink, and be merry. Who cares? I mean, go ahead and indulge your flesh because God doesn't care, doesn't concern himself with these things on this earth. So one part of the extreme is called legalism. Legalism is when we're going to obey all these laws, and by my adherence to these laws, I will win God's favor. So, for example, there were a lot of Jewish people who subscribed to Gnosticism, even 
that thought they understood the gospel. And they would say, okay, fine. Yes, believe in Jesus, but you also got to obey all the Jewish dietary laws. You have to be circumcised. You have to uh, worship on the Sabbath day. Which, by the way, what I'm saying to you now, guys, we hear all these things today in the Seventh-day Adventist, in the Jehovah's Witnesses. They all take different forms. So some people were legalists, and other people were libertines. Live however you want to live, because God doesn't care. So it doesn't matter how immoral or whatever you are, that's fine. God doesn't care about things on the earth. And both of these guys are wrong. What we have found out so far in Colossians is that in Christ, we have been made complete, and we have received the real circumcision, the circumcision that is of the heart. Now, pick up with me in Colossians chapter 2 this morning. Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 16. We're going to come to the end of the second chapter this morning and be halfway through the book of Colossians. Notice what he says as he ends the second chapter now, beginning in verse 16. Because in Christ you are complete. There's nothing missing. There's nothing more that you need to be fully grown. All you need is Jesus, because that's true. And because you have received a real circumcision, not the Jewish kind, but the real one, the kind of the heart, when your old self was cut away. Because that's true, therefore, verse 16 says, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Do not allow any person to creep into your life and begin, and the word to pass judgment means to pronounce a verdict. I declare you unapproved by God. I declare you unaccepted by God. I declare you not a Christian. I told you guys so many years ago now. I was going to Africa, and I was sitting in the airport, and I sat next to a lady. We struck up a conversation. I was there for a few hours. And we began to talk about She said she was a Christian. I said, that's great. And we started talking about Christianity. And very soon in, I found out this lady is a Seventh-day Adventist. She began to stress to me the absolute need. If you are a true Christian, you must worship on the Sabbath. This is what this is the sign that you truly are a Christian. You worship on Saturday. I'm thinking, wow, listen to what Scripture says. But this is what happens, and, all, and especially when you're a new Christian. And by the way, part of what we're doing here is really rooting you deep into Jesus, so you'll be aware when someone comes along to you at your workplace or you meet in your neighborhood and starts telling you these things. Don't let anyone pronounce a verdict on you according to what you eat and drink. And if you celebrate certain holy days, don't let anyone pass a verdict about you, the Bible says, on that regard. In fact, I want to save your place here. This is one thing that all Christians have to learn. When you do become a genuine born-again Christian, is there is freedom in the Lord for, for different Christians to come to different personal standards in their life. Some people may say, boy, this day is really special to me. And another person say, man, every, every day is the same. I love God on all the days. There's a freedom there. Look at me in Romans 14. Save your place in Colossians. This is one thing we have to learn as Christians, everybody. One thing you'll find out, by the way, the difference between genuine Christianity and a false religion. In genuine Christianity, there is freedom. In a false religion, there is none. Romans 14, listen to what it says. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. So there's one guy, maybe he came out of the Jewish faith, and his mind, he was so brought up all his life that, you know, if I eat, cert if I eat pork, let's say if I'm a Jewish person, that that is evil and that is wrong. And his conscience has been trained that way. Now he is a Christian. The Bible says, no, it is not wrong. That is a Jewish dietary law. You should enjoy it. Don't feel bad about it. But because he's weak in his faith, he still struggles with it. The Bible says, okay, fine. If it bothers him, that's fine. Don't worry, Bill. Debate with him. If he just wants to eat vegetables, let him eat vegetables. Okay, keep going. 
Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. Let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Again, there are some Jewish believers, because they've grown up all their life practicing the Jewish holy days, in their mind, it was almost like, man, on this holiday, I'm not going to go and worship. I feel this feels bad to not do this. Whereas the Gentile Christian, his conscience wasn't bound to these practices. He doesn't think anything different. So we're, we're in the same congregation. Okay, that's fine. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, verse 6, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. So we don't live and die to each other, everybody. We live and die to the Lord, and I give my brother or sister that freedom. There may be some things in their conscience that they really have a conscience about. Now, by the way, all of us, wherever the Bible says that's sin, then that's sin. We, we can all agree on that. Where the Bible has nothing to say, where it's some type of activity, uh, eating or drinking or whatever you may do, where, where the Bible doesn't say, the Bible says the thing that's to rule my behavior is, can I do it to God's glory? If I don't feel in my heart that I can do this activity to God's glory, then it's wrong for me to do. Another brother or sister may be able to do that and do it to God's glory. Okay, so watch what happens here. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so that each of us will give an account of himself to who? To God, not to your fellow Christian. So it's wrong for a fellow Christian or a religious person to sit in judgment on you. You're not going to give account to them one day. You're going to give account to God, not them. That's not my place to take that position in another Christian's life. Therefore, verse 13, do not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Now, guys, like in today's world, sometimes you'll hear, for example, this would be, there are some Christians who really feel a real conscience and really feel bad about, for example, Halloween. Because they say it's involved in things that had to do, there's some of the roots of it are evil. Other Christians look at it and they say, well, I know, no, Jesus rules over every day. There is no day. Any, Jesus rules October 31st, just like he does the 30th of November 1st. And it's fine for me if I'm just going to go out and enjoy and have innocent fun. That's totally fine. That's fine. You might have two brothers and sisters. They have one as a conscience. One, that's fine. They're both free. You give each other liberty. These are just an example. Okay, the Bible says, here's what we want to do. Do not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know, Paul says, and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. So Paul says, I know that, for example, eating pork is totally fine. But... If I invite one of my Christian brothers over to my house, and I know that he really has a conscience about this, this bothers him, I'm not going to serve him pork tenderloin. Because in his mind, for him, it doesn't feel well. Okay, fine. I'm not going to hurt him. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love by what you eat. Do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. I remember one time, you know, for example, another another case, and a lot of times different Christians can come on different positions, is, is, is the drinking of alcohol. 
There are some Christians who feel a very strong because the Bible warns and it, the Bible forbids drunkenness. That is a sin. And there are other places where the Bible says that wine is a gift from the Lord to be enjoyed, to make man's heart glad. And so, different person may be coming. I remember one time I was with uh, with a guy downtown. This guy was a brand new Christian. He had been all his life, I mean, all his adult life, really struggled with the sin of drunkenness. He had to avoid alcohol. It could not be near it. It would trigger him. I remember one time going to lunch. There was a couple other guys there, and another Christian guy was there, and we're sitting at lunch, and the guy orders a glass of wine. And I spoke to him afterwards. I said, you know, I really want to caution you in the future. I don't think that was wise to do for the sake of this brother because for him, it really, in his own heart, he has such a strong feeling about it. Let's not hurt him. And the brother responded, great, so I'll make sure. That's the kind of thing we're talking about, what Romans is saying. We want to make sure that we are sensitive to where our brother or sister is. We want to love them. And we don't want to put something in their life that's going to make them stumble. Bible says, so in verse 16, do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not what all these legalists say. The kingdom of God is, okay, I do this. You know, there are people, you know, for example, within Christianity, there is a segment within Christianity known as fundamentalism. Fundamentalism goes back about 100 years ago, and originally when fundamentalism started, these are considered the most conservative branch of born-again Christians. Fundamentalists, 100 years ago, began because they were insisting on the fundamentals of the faith, among those that God created the earth, that Jesus was born to a virgin, that Jesus is God. I'm talking the real fundamentals. Over time... There was a new group within Christianity that developed. They called themselves the New Evangelicals. The New Evangelicals, as a strategy, said, you know what? The fundamentalists, have set, they've left the academy. They've kind of separated themselves from the world. We want to get back in the universities. But to do that, we got to kind of tone down our separatism. And in some ways, they compromised some things that were fundamentals. But then over time, what happened was fundamentalists, in a lot of cases, became more associated not with the fundamental doctrines of the faith, but more on outward behaviors. So fundamentalists became associated with women always dressed a certain way. You never went to a movie theater, for example, because the reason why some people had a conscience about that, because they said, well, I don't want to support anything that give money to an organization that could use it to make bad movies. Well, then what happens is, if you're not careful, the human tendency is you start judging one another. Does this person dress the way I do? Do they eat what I do? Do they go places? And now I'm going to judge you based on whether or not you follow the same rules I have. Now, this is wrong. The scripture says this is not the way it is to be. Okay, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but here's where it really is. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. I want to have a, let's all be in this together, united around the true fundamentals. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's where our unity is. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Guys, another category within fundamentals, and sometimes fundamentals have separated other Christians from, is in the category of music. Some <laughs> fundamentalists separated from any music that had any type of a beat to it because they said, well, wait a minute, uh, music with a beat to it is associated with a, a whole genre of the world, a kind of music that takes people, and we know, is there some music that can really corrupt you? Absolutely it can. Remember how I told you the Orthodox Jews would say, okay, here's God's law, but the Mishnah is our law. So if you don't break this law, you'll never break God's law. So what happened within fundamentalism sometimes is God never said this, but I'm going to say it, and this becomes gospel. But God never said it. 
So for, but you know the hard thing about that, if you're gonna take that position, I will reject all kind of music that has a beat to it. What happens if you go to a different part of the world? You go to Africa and they, they have a whole different culture. So there, there, there is a freedom within, this is what you feel when you're controlled by Christ, there is a freedom there. So he says in verse 20, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. God says, here's the main thing I want you to worry about. In your own life, does your own conscience approve of what you're doing or not approve? If it doesn't approve, you shouldn't do it. If it does approve, you're fine. If you can do it to the glory of God, that's fine. He says this, verse 23, Whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith, or whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. If you can't do it in good faith, it's wrong for you to do. All right? Now that's a whole chapter. Now come back to Colossians 2. Not let anyone pronounce a verdict on you on these external things. Whether you eat what you eat and what you drink, whether or not you observe these special days. Why does he say that we are not to let anyone do this? Notice verse 17. Because these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Christ is the real thing. You know what the whole Old Testament law was, everybody? All the dietary laws, all the special holy days, all those things were pictures. They were symbols. Jesus is the real thing. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, but not the true substance of these realities. Jesus is the reality. Don't fall in love with the external things. I remember one time clearly saying a couple of years ago during one of our friend days, and there was a lady who came, and some of you guys might remember her a couple of years ago, and she was here, they'd come on tours with us, an older woman, and she sat here this morning, and I explained that morning that I think a lot of people are what I call Old Testament Christians. They're still following, they think that becoming a Christian is about the ceremonies, the masses, the sacrifices, the redeems. She said to me after the service, you know, I never thought of that. I'm an Old Testament Christian, she said to me. This is a lot of religious people. So they, they've been told, okay, yes, believe in Jesus, but also worship on the Sabbath. Believe in Jesus and dress this way. Believe in Jesus and don't do this. Believe in, and then if you do all these kind of things, plus believe in Jesus then you're really a Christian. This is not what the Scripture says. The Bible says all those Jewish laws and days were shadows. Jesus is the substance. So what he says in verse 18. Let no one disqualify you. You know what that word comes from? It comes from an umpire. Now, guys, some of you guys know, I was a soccer referee, a lacrosse referee, a basketball referee and a baseball umpire. There have been occasions when I have thrown people out of the game. <laughs> Happens very rarely, but it has happened. And this word disqualify means don't let them throw you out of the game. Don't let any other religious person or quote-unquote Christian disqualify you, throw you out of the game like an umpire, insisting on asceticism, the word I told you about a little while ago. This rigorous, strict self-denial, extreme abstinence, forbidding the normal pleasures of life. And by the way, have you ever heard religions that do that, that forbid you just from being a human? For example, 1 Timothy chapter 4, turn there with me. Right after Colossians, we have Thessalonians and then Timothy. Notice 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. This is very interesting. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4, 1, the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Now that's amazing, guys. That there are actually religious teachings, people that you see so dressed nice, 
They meet in a beautiful space, and they're actually teaching the doctrines of demons. What are these doctrines? These demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, what do they do? They forbid marriage. Now, guys, are there not religions that forbid their priests from marrying? They forbid marriage. There's nothing wrong. Marriage is a gift of God. Males and females are great gifts of God. The, the, the relationship between a man and a woman is a great gift from God. This is nothing bad. They forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods. Again, think about the most dominant religion in this state. For many, many Roman Catholics, what was every Friday? Fish. Fish. You don't eat, and you go through certain times here, just like the Muslims do, during the entire month of Ramadan. They eat in the morning, they eat at dinner, and they fast all day. God's going to be pleased with me. And go home to their four wives later on. But God's pleased because they fast. Or people who take the ash and put it across their forehead. They look really nice. <laughs> The Bible says these are actually doctrines of demons. People that forbid you from being human. Abstain from foods that God created to be received for thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For Guys, this is a great line. For everything created by God is good. And nothing to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Don't let anyone tell you that what God created is bad. Men accuse human love and human food, and they're fine. They're, they're good. They're God's gift to you. So he says back in our text, Colossians, let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and the worship of angels going on in detail about visions Got to watch out. Someone says, I had a vision last night. Run for the door. A vision is something they see in their mind. I've known some who've had visions. The Bible says, you know what we do? We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. I don't care what you've seen. What does the scripture say? What does it say? You say, well, I saw this. God told me this. I saw this. You may be very nice. What does the scripture say? Watch out. They're religious people, and they want to talk to you all about the visions they've had. And by the way, who are the founders of all the cults? People who had visions. Joseph Smith sat in the mountains of New York State, and he had a vision that an angel Moroni appeared to him and gave him these tablets, and he presented to us the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And what can we say? He had a vision. What we can say is, Joseph, what does the Scripture say? Muhammad, 500 A.D., 500 years after Jesus, Muhammad is in a desert, by himself, he says an angel appears to him and teaches him what we know today as Islam. And we all got to trust him. In his case, if we don't, we'll take your head off. But he got a vision. Someone spoke to him. No. Be careful of people that come to you with visions. I don't care what you saw in your mind. What does the scripture say? Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up. This means they're inflated with arrogance. They're swollen with pride. Why? Because they think they have a deeper knowledge. They know something that you don't know. God gave them a secret, a secret message. None of the rest of us have heard yet. And actually the scripture tells us everything I need for life and godliness I already have in Jesus. That's what Colossians has been saying. You already make them, there's nothing else you're missing. So if someone says to you, I have new information that no one's ever known before, God came to me. And this is what happens with all the cults. 
Charles Taze Russell, the Jehovah's Witnesses. He suddenly had some new understanding. <clears throat> Scripture says, watch out for any of these, any of these type of people. Everything you have, you already, you're made complete in Christ, you were circumcised in Christ, and in Christ all the fullness of God dwells. There's nothing else. The Bible says about these people, they are puffed up without reason. Do you notice that? In other words, these guys are proud. I don't know why. <laughs> they have no cause to be, but they are. And what are they puffed up by, everybody, according to verse 18? Their sensuous mind. That means their earthly mind, their fleshly mind. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If you are still thinking with a fleshly mind. By the way, in the New Testament, the word flesh is not talking about your body. It's talking about a category of person. A person who does not yet have God's spirit. They are living by their human nature. They have a fleshly mind. They have a mind of the earth. And the Bible says when you come to Christ, you no longer have a fleshly mind. You have the mind of the spirit. But these people are puffed up with a fleshly mind, the mind of their human nature. And the Bible tells us that when any man comes to Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That is why any person who really believes the gospel will not stay in the Roman Catholic Church. They will not stay in the Jehovah's Witnesses. They will not stay in the Mormons. They will not stay in the Seventh-day Adventists. If you truly understand the gospel, you will leave. They're teaching a different gospel. The Bible says, when you come to Christ, you're made new. Look what it says now in verse 19. These type of people who speak of their visions and insist on asceticism are people who do not hold fast to the head. Who is the head? The Bible tells us in Ephesians 4 and verse 15, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Christ is the head. Here's how you know a real Christian. There's one person they grasp onto. They only grasp onto Christ. They don't come to you with the gospel plus the pearl of great price the Mormons want to produce. They don't come to you with the gospel plus the watchtower. They don't come to you with the gospel or anything plus anything. They don't come to you with the gospel plus the Jewish laws. No additions. Just Jesus. These are people who do not hold fast to the head, the Bible says, from whom the whole body nourished. That means, and by the way, this is in the passive voice. This means someone else is doing this to the body. The whole body being supplied, it is being richly supplied, and what else is the whole body being? Knit together. Imagine that. Now, some of you ladies might go and do this. Maybe some of you guys, I don't, I don't know how to knit, but you could never do it. But when you do it, and all these things, you take these strings and tie them together, and things get so intertwined, it becomes one piece. The Bible says that the head is doing this to the church. Jesus is knitting the church together. Think about that. Who is the great knitter of the church? Jesus. Some of you women think you can crochet. Wait till you see what he can do. Take all the people together and blind them and bind them together. That's amazing unity. Jesus is doing it. And Jesus is also richly supplying all the members of that body. He's bringing them all together. So we're all hanging on to Jesus. We're grasping on to him. And while that's happening, he's knitting us together and supplying us with more and more of the parts that we need. And guess what happens at the end of that verse? We are growing with a growth that is from God. That's what we want, everybody. We want a genuine growth, the kind that God gives. Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is who bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. This is what Jesus said, what the Holy Testament says. What you want to do is one thing. Just 
Put your roots deep in Jesus. Get to know Jesus. Believe what he has done for you. Understand <coughs> all that he has done and what he is doing for you right now. That's all you need. That's all you need. Don't worry about visions and all these rules and being ascetic and all those kind of things that these people try to get you to do. You want the growth that comes from God? Grasp onto Jesus. Verse 20 says, If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, remember I told you last week this is a word for like the ABCs of the world, the basic fundamentals of the way the world thinks. When you put your faith in Jesus, remember you died with him to that old way. The Bible says in Galatians 6, verse 14, But God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom I was crucified to the world, and the world was crucified to me. On that day, I died to the way the world thinks. I don't think like they think anymore. He says in verse 20, If with Christ you die to that way, why, as if you were still alive, verse 20, in the world, do you submit to regulation? Someone says to you, quote, unquote, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts. By the way, do you notice that in verse 22? Whose precepts are these? Are these God's precepts? They're human precepts. That's so why I told you in the very beginning about the Mishnah. These are human precepts. These are not God's. And people, if you're not careful, we're going to try to bind you with all these rules. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. And they're according to human precepts. Now, again, where God says don't do this, then that's his, that's his word. If, it's, if he hasn't said that and someone else does, that's not his word. The Bible says, you die to that old way of thinking. Don't let, why, why go back and obey all those rules again? Okay, I got to go be physically circumcised. I got to obey all the Jewish dietary laws. I got to do all these things. Again, what does Rome say to you? Oh, yes, we believe that Jesus died for us. But if you want to make sure you go to heaven, you got seven sacraments. And you're going to need some help. You're going to need Mary's help. You're going to need lots of different people's help. What the scripture says. The Bible says, when you came to Jesus, you died to that way of thinking. So why would you do it again? The Bible says, for freedom, Christ has set you free. So stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Don't let anybody bring you back from that slavery again. God bust you free out of that. Be free. Verse 23, finally. These indeed, these kinds of rules indeed, have an appearance of wisdom. In other words, they have a reputation. They have a, a facade. They have the guise of being wise. When you look at them, they say, wow, well, maybe that is wise. They have an appearance that they're wise. He says, indeed, they do. They look like it because they look religious. They look impressive. You say, wow, isn't that person so impressive? You know, I, I, it's been amazed sometimes how people will fall in love with some religious person who looks like strange. You know, here they, I, I noticed at the dunk, you know, some years ago they had the Dalai Lama come. You know, he sits up at the Dunkin' Donuts and the place was packed, sitting in a monk robe, you know, sitting on the stage, meditating, and every once in a while saying some words. It was like, I remember some years ago, Oprah Winfrey had her guru on there. Some of you guys might have heard of him, Eckhart Tolle. Eckhart Tolle is a short little man. I think he's from New Zealand. He sits on the stage, you know, and he talks in a very peaceful, soft voice. <laughs> Reality is within you. And all those people are just amazed. <laughs> the words coming out of this guy's mouth, you know. And yet, Jesus has clearly spoken of Scripture. Not interested in that. But let me see the Dalai Lama get his autograph. Or let me have the Pope come through in his mobile that he rides through. He goes to the cities and the people just pass out. People love to go to these ceremonies. They go and then all the people, the priests are coming out with their smoke and their incense. I saw them. We were in Greece. Remember you guys? We would see the Greek Orthodox priests walking down the road. 
people are impressed by these things. They love the pomp. They love the circumstance. They love the ceremony. And Jesus is saying, okay, are you tired of the shadow? Would you like the substance? And most people say, no, we don't want the substance. Give me the shadow. Give me some more ceremony. Give me some more Dalai Lamas. Give me the people that look so impressive. I'm amazed. I'm stunned by how beautiful and righteous this person is. The Bible says that's a doctrine of the demon. Don't be deceived. Indeed, these have the appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, it says in verse 23. But look what this says. They are of no value in doing what? Stopping the indulgence of the flesh, the gratification of your flesh, actually going and dressing like a monk and doing all these ceremonies and chanting and trying to find yourself and doing things that people do, they actually are of no value from stopping you from indulging your flesh. Because you know what they're actually doing? They're actually, in a strange way, they're actually appealing to your flesh. The pride of it. The awe of people. The applause of people that, wow, the self-discipline you have is amazing. Jesus said that about the Pharisees, right? They love the applause of men. They love to walk in the marketplaces and people say that, oh, Father. And it's all a fraud. Jesus says, watch out for anything like this because it actually has no value. Remember I told you guys, in the New Testament, the flesh is a category of person. It's someone apart from Jesus. And do you know something, everybody? The chief characteristic of fleshly righteousness is its focus on outward measurable rules. That's how you know it is a righteousness of the category of the flesh. They measure it outwardly. Measurable things you do and don't do. That's why you can see some people that maybe grow up, let's say, in kind of a Christian home, but maybe where the error was made, maybe if it wasn't said straight out, it was kind of modeled that real righteousness is outward by the things you do and don't do. And all of a sudden, this person has real no connection to the head. They really have no connection to Christ. In the day they, they're 18 years old and the parents pull out the scaffolding, the first thing they do is they run right to the devil. Why? Because they were never attached to Jesus. And as soon as obeying all those rules don't get them anything anymore, there's nothing of those. You know what the message of this passage is, everybody? Real righteousness is only in Christ. That's where it is. So the question is, Do you want to be really righteous? Come to Jesus. If not, if you're satisfied with self-made religion and appearing well-eyes and appearing religious, fine. But it's of no value. The Bible says in Romans 3, verse 24, you are declared and treated as really righteous as a gift by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 5, verse 1, we are declared and treated as truly righteous by faith through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 3, God has done what the law could not do, weakened by the flesh, in sending his own Son in likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For if you walk according to the flesh, for those who walk according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who walk according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. To set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Do you want real righteousness? Do you want real peace? Do you want real life? It will not come in any ways. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 verse 4, Christ 
is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. This is what the scripture says. The Bible says that God made Jesus to become sin for us who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, Christ became to us righteousness. Well, that's why Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They want the real thing. They will be satisfied. So guys, that's the question this morning. Do you want real righteousness? If you want the real thing and not the shadow, real righteousness only comes in Christ. Now let us pray. Lord, we pray that you would help us to want the real thing and not the fake thing. The righteousness which comes through faith in Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to hold fast to the head who is nourishing and knitting us together so that we grow with the growth that comes from God. And may we never again submit it to a yoke of slavery. We pray, Lord, that you might help us all as we have seen Christ Jesus the Lord to walk in him, rooted and built up in the face and established faith and established therein with thanksgiving. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.